Thank you for tuning in to Upon the Rock broadcast. I'm your host, Pastor Lawrence Shakir. I believe the Word of God will build a godly foundation in the lives of people. There is more available information on our website. You can log on to ShakirMinistries.org. Now, let's go on to today's message. You all ready for the Word? All right, we're making good time, too. I thought we were going to be a little late, but we're, we're good. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for this time. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to say. I thank you, Lord, that these people that are gathered here, Lord, you already knew who's going to be here. So regardless of how I felt when I was studying the message, God, you knew exactly who needs to hear this. So we thank you, Lord, that you are in this room. Your presence is here. And as everything that I've studied, Lord, let it come out, Lord, and let revelation knowledge flow freely in this place. Move up every single aisle, every single row, and touch, heal, and deliver, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So we're still in our FBI. And you all been enjoying it so far? You been getting some stuff out of this? It's a pretty cool school, I think. So today is going to be one of those teachings that's a little bit, uh, I'm going to say it like this. It's been, it's been kind of abused, but it needs to be brought out with balance. Because sometimes people take one part of the scripture and they only focus on just that. So what I attempt to do is kind of just show you all uh, what the Bible says. And then I want the Holy Spirit to kind of reveal things to you. Okay, so I want you all to take notes. I want you to develop those questions or whatever. I know most leaders already know that. And for those of you all that, that came and visit, just kind of just follow along. If you have your Bibles, it's good. If you have it on your phones, that's, that's great too. This is going to be a, a biblical talking i know a lot of times i have powerpoints but we're going to open our bibles on this one okay because you got to see it for yourself and don't just take it on the screen so go to my next uh point please so this one is called a lifestyle of giving oh wow and i know and i was thinking about this i said lord what if we have first time visiting he said well they need to hear it and it would be almost like kind of ironic that you come and, and visit them the first time and somebody's talking about giving. Well, that's not, that's not the purpose of what we're trying to do because uh, it's just time. Now, I spent all last year and I haven't talked to you all about giving that one time, right? The reason why I did that is because I don't want you all to think that that's what we're after. But I don't want you all to also think that giving all, always reserves just for money. See, it's a lifestyle of giving. And I'm not trying to brag myself, but I'm a, I'm a giver. I'm a person who who sees things, and if it's and if a need that I can meet, I give it. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's uh, other things. Like I was telling you that time I saw the homeless man, he asked me for some money. Well, I actually didn't feel led to give him the money, but I felt led to feed him because he was talking about he wanted to eat something. So I took him inside the restaurant and, and let him order whatever he want. Well, that broke out to Thanksgiving with God to him because he was hungry. He couldn't eat money. But he can eat a sandwich, you see? So my point is, when God starts to move on your, on your heart and say, I want you to start giving in this direction, you have to be sensitive enough to know, God, what do you want me to do? Because anytime God asks you to do something, it's only because he has something down the line. And just like how we talked about faithfulness a few weeks ago, if you can't be trusted over that, he can't trust you with this, sometimes God will, before he gets to a point where he's going to bless you, He comes all the way back to the present and say, I want you to do this. And if you do that, it lines you up for whatever he has in store. But a lot of times people are stopping their own blessings because their heart is too caught on on issues like this. Now, we got to deal with this because it's one of the things that kind of help you walk into the blessings of God. Now, I'm going to say this in, in the teaching, though, but you can always recognize well, let me, give you, let me give you a story. I heard a story of a, um, a, and I hope I say it right. You all probably know the story too. But it was, a, it was this poor little kid in England. I don't know where it was. But he was looking at some shoes because he was homeless and he had no, he had no, no shoes. <laughs> so he was looking in the window and he saw people in there, other kids trying on shoes and everything, and he was just kind of just sitting there. And so this other lady came up and she noticed that he was, you know, looking in the window, you know, kind of staring at these shoes. And then he said, um, she said, what size shoe you wear? 
And he told her and everything. So he, she went in there, bought him the shoes, got him socks and everything, and got him everything, and pat him on the head and kind of left. And he grabbed her by the hand and said, are you God's wife? You know, because sometimes some people only see God through people. Because God is not going to always come down and just do something spectacular. He does it through the church, through the salt of the earth. So we got to learn how to recognize and have a lifestyle. Not just, I'm just not talking about just giving because that's what you were taught. You got to have a lifestyle of this. Go to my next point, please. So point number one, make it rain. Now, a lot of times people think that God is going to do something like this. Rain down money from heaven. When's the last time you've seen God rain down money from heaven? Never. But in our imagination, it may look like this. And we're like, God, I receive. See, the body of Christ is real good when it comes to receiving. Oh, I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive. But God says in order to receive, you have to, you have to actually have to do something. So let's go to our Bibles real quick. We're on point one, make it rain. Let's go to Luke chapter six. In fact, let's kind of take turns so we can kind of all hear each other so it won't just be me talking. But somebody go to Luke chapter six, verse 38, and somebody else go to Galatians chapter six, verse seven. Luke chapter six, verse 38. Galatians chapter six, verse seven. And when you have it, just say, I have it. All right, can you go ahead and read that, please? And pour it into your lap. Now, the King James Version says it like, Give and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give into your bosoms? Now, I know in some translations that kind of take that out. But when it says men give into your bosoms, meaning that when you start giving, don't start thinking that. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm just focusing the part on money because that's what got a lot of people's heart. But when he talks about giving, he says that it's going to be brought back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But the King James Version, like I said earlier, says, shall men give to you. So a lot of times, your harvest is going to be wrapped up into, the, into, the, into somebody else's hands. Y'all get what I'm trying to say? It could be promotion. It can be finances. You know, those mystery checks that kind of come in the mail that have your name on it. Yeah, that, God can do that. But he also can give you ideas for business. He can give you opportunities. But he can also give you favor. Y'all know that? Favor is one of those things that don't cost anything. It's just that people just like you because they just like you. And they give you an opportunity that they wouldn't give anybody else. Well, how many of you know that's from God too? So God is saying that we can't just look at him like make it rain. Rain down money from heaven. But he says that if you're going to give, make sure you give. And she said it beautifully in an offering time. Give with the right kind of heart because that's the kind of harvest that God will always respond to. If you just give because it's, let's just say, offering time or you give because you feel like you need to and you really don't want to do it, you might as well keep your money. You might as well keep everything because your heart is not in it. See, God looks at your heart before you do anything. He looks at the secret man. And so when you just kind of just do something because you feel like you have to do it, there's no harvest connected to that. Every time you give, make sure that God has either spoken to you or you're responding to what God told you to do. Somebody had Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, right? Be, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatever, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Read that one more time, please. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Question What is the whatsoever? Whatever you do. Whatever. If, there you go. It doesn't have to be money. A lot of people focus on money because the love of money is the root of all evil. And the Bible talks about in Ecclesiastes that money uh, is the root, uh, is, is answers all. And one song said, money is the key to everything. I don't know what they say, but point is, a lot of money makes the world go around, right? That's what, okay. <laughs> that's what it is. But a lot of people focus on that because that's the currency of our culture. And it's so important to everybody. You go to work to get what? Money. You spend eight hours a day smiling at them customers and you don't want to smile at them because you want money so you can pay bills and everything right so uh when she read the scripture that said whatsoever that means whatever it is 
it's going to be given back. But then I like the beginning part when it says God is not mocked. In other words, you can't play around with God on this one. If you're going to do something for God and you try to have another agenda, another ulterior motive, how many of you know God sees that? He's, so when people give, uh, oh, if you give in this offering and in 10 days you're going to have a, a hundredfold and they get in that line, oh, I'm sowing my seed, I'm sowing my seed. And then they go home and not get the harvest. You know why? <laughs> because God saw their heart. They're only giving because they want to get something back. They don't care about the kingdom. They don't care about the body of Christ. They just care about getting my harvest. And then when God doesn't answer their harvest, they're ready to suck their teeth at God and talk them out. See, I tried that thing and it don't work. You know why it didn't work? Because your heart wasn't right. So when he said, whatsoever you sow, that is what you're going to harvest. The that is the whatever it is. She talked about time. If you sow time, yes, you're going to get time back. If you sow kindness and favor, that kind of stuff will be restored back. But it all has a foundation of love. If you don't do it with love, you're wasting your time. Read the, that scripture one more time, please. It's a lot of meat in there. We have to see God is not mocked. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That shall he also reap. All right. Um, and I'm going to go real quick. You all don't have to go here. But I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. Proverbs chapter, you can take notes if you want to on this one. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. I'm going to read out of NIV. It says this, a generous man will prosper. A generous man will prosper. Not so much just a person who just gives, but a generous person. In other words, it takes a certain type of person to be generous. In other words, this, um, anybody can, be, can give something, but everybody's not generous. Okay? So if everybody's not generous, that means that it has something to do with your motive. OK, so uh, you can be a nice person and give time because you have some time to spare. But if you're not a generous kind of person, the Bible says right here that this generous person will be blessed or will be prosperous. And then it says he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Going back to that scripture again, whatever you do for somebody else, sooner or later, that's going to be your, your kind of harvest. Now, I know this is one of those teachings that's like, oh, man, because it forces us to do something. My point is. A lot of times God is trying to bless us. He really is. The problem is we just don't qualify for the blessing. And it's not anything God's fault either. It's only because we decided I'm not going to do that. You hear what I'm trying to say? My challenge to you all is make sure you try to develop a lifestyle of being generous or, or, or giving. Now, I'm not saying you got to. You know, there's one of those things that you had to give to the church all the time. I'm just saying you got to make sure you are a giver. If you give people gift certificates, if you give them whatever, just make sure that you can be a blessing to other people. Because that's what Jesus is, uh, wants his people to be about, being a blessing to everybody else. Yeah, they can hear what you say if you give them the word and everything, but it's far more in impacting when you can actually do something for them. Because they, that's the Jesus they can see. Okay? Sometimes Jesus didn't even give people a word. He just healed them and kept on going. And a lot of times God's going to kind of put us in positions where we can just meet a need. And we're not trying to get the credit. You can just meet the need and keep on going. All right. So make it rain, Lord. That's some people's prayers. I need this. I need that. Yes, you can get it. But it also responds to what you're going to do. Next point, please. It's a kingdom law. It's a kingdom law. You get a car. You get a car. Y'all seen that before? Oprah gave away all those cars. One thing I'm going to uh, talk, and I'm not talking against Oprah on this one. Oprah is a giver. You know why one of the reasons why she's so blessed? And she may not be all, all Bible either, but that girl can give. She's a giver. If it's anything, and it's not just her, it's a lot of what you call those celebrities and big time people that got it to give. Most of those people, even though they're not Christian so much, they tapped into a kingdom law. In other words, a law is what? It'll work for anybody who works it. Gravity is a law, right? Whether you believe it or not, it's a law. Step off the building, you're going to be a believer real quick, right? <laughs> but it's a law, meaning that it's going to happen regardless. So some of these kingdom things, it's not just for Christians. It's for everybody. So she's giving cars away and she's paying people's houses off and she's doing all this and everything. And it's a lot of stuff coming back to her. And she didn't have to just, you know, get in some healing line, sow my seed. No, she just being a giver 
and that kingdom law is, is operating in people's lives. Y'all see what I'm trying to say? So it's not just, it's not just money. I don't want y'all to think about it as just money. It's about you being a generous person and you are a giver. The Bible calls it a giver, but it's basically being a generous person with, with whatever God has given you. So sometimes you may not be using a certain thing in your house and you want to say, uh, I'm not going to give this away because it's worth money. Sometimes you can just be a blessing to somebody else just by giving it to them for free or whatever, whatever God placed on your heart. And then God will start opening doors. Let's just say if you give away a couch or a bed or something like that, you give that away and you don't need another bed because you bought another one. I'm just using that as an example. But God will give you something else because you met somebody else's need. You now qualify for, to meet some of your needs. That's why certain people can spend so much years talking about, God, when are you going to bless me? When are you going to bless me? And God said, you're the one that's actually stopping up the blessing. It's not me because blessings will flow, but sometimes he only will bless a generous person. Like he said in Proverbs chapter 11, 25, if you're not a generous person, you're still saved. You're still going to heaven. You still got the favor of God on you, but some stuff are not being released. And we got we to gotta talk about stuff like this, you all, because that's what's stopping some of us from, from getting to the next level. Because we're too stingy. Let's just say it. We're just too stingy. And I was a kid when I was growing up. I was a stingy kid. My brothers were always tell all, and they called me Low. That's my name, Low. Low always stingy. He don't want to give anything. He don't want to share anything. I had to learn how to be generous. Because part of my nature is if I get it, I'm not giving anybody anything. Don't you play with me. You know, but I was the kind of person that if I hadn't learned how to be generous, I wouldn't be walking in blessings. And I, and I say that not to come off as a braggadocio kind of guy, but I can honestly say that I live, I live a blessed life. I do. I'm not all rich and making it rain. I'm not like that. But, I mean, I got a beautiful wife. I've been married to her for 12 years. Love her. Got strong, healthy boys. Um, I'm not in a lot of financial debt. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, make y'all look at me with googly eyes. I live in a beautiful home. Uh, and I'm happy, healthy. And a lot of it is because God is with me, but some of it is also because I've learned to have a lifestyle of being generous and giving. Some of the stuff, God couldn't trust me with that, with the house I have now if I wasn't generous with the little apartment that I was before. So sometimes God looks at you where you're at to see can he trust you with bigger things. And one key thing to see if he can trust you is how are you going to be generous at the stage you're at? I'm just saying because a lot of people say, when I win the lottery, oh, I'm going to give to the church. Wait a minute. <laughs> what about the little $2 right now? Because that's what he's looking at. He's not looking at when you get this way. Uh-oh, pulling up my podcast. Test, test, test. Okay, we're good. God's not looking at what you uh, do when you get to a certain level. He wants to see what you're going to do right now. Can you be generous right now? Well, Lord, I need this one. I know you need it, but can you still be generous at the stage you're at? Because before you can give away cars and do all this kind of stuff, you have some dark times where God can see, can I trust you at this little small level? I tell you, all, we got to talk about stuff like this. So this is a kingdom law. All right. And let me just everybody just go to Proverbs chapter 18 and um, 24. Yeah, it's one of those teachings. Y'all may be quiet on this one. But I guarantee you, if you get this principle, it will unlock all types of blessings in your life. Proverbs chapter, what I say, 18, 24. Let's read that, somebody, please. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. <coughs> all right. And, okay, that's Proverbs 18 and 24. A man of many companions may come close to ruin but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's good. But I thought I wrote down the other one that says. Yeah, what verse is that? It's 24. Oh, okay. So I read it wrong. Did I? It's a different version. Sorry. Okay. King James Version. Miss uh, Robin, do you mind reading that out loud, please? A man that had friends must show himself friendly. Mm -hmm. There is a friend that speaks. Very good. I love how that King James Version, especially with the ithoth and the thiseth and everything. <laughs> but uh, it says, uh, 
if you have no friends, according to that scripture, you're not a friendly person. The reason why your harvest of friends are not coming, because you mean. It's because you you somebody who everybody run away from. Because the Bible says if a man, uh, let's read that one more time, please, if you don't mind, ma'am. A man that hath friends must mm -hmm. show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than. So in other words, there's in that verse right there, I see levels of type of let's call it harvest. You are a lonely person. You don't have any friends. First thing you need to do is sow friendship or show friendliness. Sow that in there and then you'll have friends. But then it also says that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In other words, God will also give you somebody who's not just having a group of friends, but you'll have people who are life partners, life friends. How many of you know those kind of people are hard to find? But God says if you sow yourself, show yourself friendly, the harvest is this kind of stuff will happen. Destiny people will come and connect themselves to you. But destiny people ain't going to come connect themselves to a bunch of mean type of people that don't want to be friendly and everything. So God is saying, but whatever you don't have, give that away. And that's what's going to come back to you. That's what he's talking about. This is not one of those things. Uh, see there, that's why I don't give to people. Because, no, God is saying, whatever is a lack to you, and you know what a lack is for you. He said, that's what you need to give away. And what that, whatsoever, like we read before, whatsoever that is, that's what's going to start coming back to you. You do it with the right heart, do it with the right spirit, and you do it the right way, that kind of stuff will start connecting itself. And that's when destiny and everything else and all this purpose are waking up because you have done something that you didn't have. And God knew that you needed the two mites like the widow woman, but you use it anyway. And then that's how harvest starts coming. People don't like to talk about that, but that's the truth. And that's a kingdom law. Okay? Y'all get anything so far? And I'm not going to uh, go through it, but I do want to quote this scripture in Acts chapter 15, verse 8. You can write it down if you like. But it's, it talks about how God is a giver. How he gave the Holy Spirit. Y'all know that, right? It talks about that Jesus says, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to give the Holy Spirit. And he's going to stay with you forever, which is the friend that sticks closer than the brother. The most famous scripture in the Bible that most people are being taught is what? John 3.16. What does it say? What is the first part of that scripture again? That. There you go. So in other words, there's a love and then there's a soul love. In other words, oh, I love you. I respect you. But you get on my nerve. That kind, no, not, that's not what he's talking about. But there's a soul love that because I so love you, like we got these, these beautiful children here, a parent will so love their children that they will, they will do whatever it takes. Even if they would starve in order for their kids to, to eat, they would do that. That's what you call a soul love, that you just give. So it's not somebody putting a gun to your head or twisting your arm, but it's one of those things that because I so love, I'm going to do this. Now, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his best, which was Jesus. He so loved. My point is, you can't give without having that love there. Don't give if you don't have no foundation of love. If you have love, which the Bible talks about that moves God, then, then your giving will be real. Otherwise, you're just going through a religious motion and you're not going to get any harvest. Y'all get anything out of it so far? Okay. Because this is some of the things, like I said before, it keeps stopping a lot of people of the body of Christ. And I know because we had bad teaching on it too. You get people that just try to take advantage over the sheep and they try to just, you know, eat the sheep because they trying to <laughs> wear alligator shoes and everything and shiny suits and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, driving them Bentleys. Well, I'm just saying, I don't need to wear alligator shoes. I'm fine with these Nikes. <laughs> <laughs> My point is that you got to get to the point that whatever you do, make sure you have love. And when you give it in love, things will start happening the right way. Okay? And then you may be in a position where you can give away 300 cars or whatever. But God says he did this because he so loved. Jesus was a life-giving spirit. The Bible, the Bible said the gospel is even given for free. You don't have to pay for the gospel. It's given for free. So God himself is a giver. And since God is a giver, he wants his children to kind of have that same thread of giving. Y'all get it? I always can tell a mature person when you don't have to kind of prop them up to give. You just tell them or they just hear something and they just do it. You can tell, okay, this person has matured in an area. They, they know something. Y'all see what I'm trying to say? 
So God wants us to get to the point where he don't have to convince us to give. He don't have to convince us to do this, do this right thing because this, you know, this, your next door neighbor is low on, on their rent and they can barely feed themselves and they just all sharing a can of beans and you up there talking about, oh, it's tough to be you. No, you could probably go and get them a, a dinner meal for that night so they can have some warm meal. It didn't have to be so much money, but you just met a need. And you don't have to go and sound and trouble. Yeah, I, I bought y'all that dinner. Y'all need to, you know, tell me thank you. No, you didn't do all that. Just give them the stuff or whatever and do it. Now, God told me to just show, share you all with this. When I was a youth pastor, I had several families that were, you know, they fell on a lot of hard times. And then God had me in a position where I couldn't just buy them groceries, but I would go and get gift certificates for them. And in one particular family in particular, they was on the verge of being put out or their stuff was on the street and they just now got in and they had nothing to eat at all. Well, God said, go and go buy them a $200 gift certificate for food. And then gave it to them. They filled up their freezer and it broke out with thanksgiving to God. Not to me, but to God. And a lot of times God wants you to be that kind of distribution center that when you see a need and you can just meet it, then things will start happening for you. So it's not so much about money, money, money. It's about you being in a position where you can help somebody and you have no strings attached. That's all he wants. Because God is like that. Next point. Y'all get anything? All right. No giving means no receiving. Basically, you can stop your own thing. You can, you can, you can thank God for the harvest. <laughs> thank God, it's my season, it's my season. You can do all that. But at the end of the day, if you haven't deposited anything, you're not going to get anything. It just, it just, it's the way it works. And again, God is not after your money, but he is trying to seek and he trusts you with certain things. And a lot of times it starts right here. Have you even considered to uh, help somebody else or plant something else? You can't expect this strawberry to grow if you haven't planted any strawberry seeds. That's just crazy. Lord, they quiet today, but it's okay. I know you're listening. But you know, a lot of uh, preachers steer from this because they don't want to offend people. But then on the other side, you get other preachers who just talk about this all the time. You got to find balance. That's why I don't talk a whole lot about this because most of you all are just, you're just, you're just people, people of the kingdom. They just do what God calls you to do. And thank God for that because he just sent you all to, to do that. But sometimes you can, some people, they have the love of money on their heart and it stops them from doing anything else. The Bible says the love of money is what? Root of all evil. And so they'll get mad with situations or, or, or topics like this because it's, it's, it's messing with their God, little g, God. Okay? God is not broke and he doesn't need your finances to finance heaven he got gold on the streets he wants us to be in a position where we're acting like him that's what it's about he wants us to get to the point and i'm just slowing now he wants us to get to the point that money or the the, the pursuit of money does not have our heart so much that that that's all we think about nothing wrong with you getting the business and and doing all the stuff that god calls you to do but if that kind of stuff is more than god than the kingdom you don't qualify because he, why would he bless you by cursing you at the same time? Lord, oh, let me get this lottery so I can win and this Powerball. And you're going to just go out and make it rain and, and not let and not do anything when it comes to God at all. God said, I'm not going to do that. It's the same reason why uh, certain people don't get married. They're maybe not be ready to be married, but they're praying, Lord, send me. Like I know this guy, he would, he would tell me, I want, I want this wife. I want a wife. But he's not a husband here. And he's like, um, I want a wife, I want a wife. God bless me with a wife, God bless me with a wife. And I'm like, why would God curse his daughter by blessing you? <laughs> Sorry, that's, that sounds hard, no, it's deep, isn't it? I know, but I don't know where that came from, but I like it. I'm gonna Twitter that one. Anyway. <laughs> I'm just joking. But you know what, God, God won't do that. If things line up right, you're in position to receive that. But don't be praying to God, bless me with this, and he gotta curse somebody else in order to bless you. God don't work like that. So some people are just not in a position because up here, it hadn't reached up here or most importantly right here. So 
You may be saying, Lord, bless me with this wife, bless me with this, bless me with this house, bless me with this new car. Why would God bless you with a, a new car and a church of chicken bones under the one you got now? <laughs> you're not even taking care of this one now. God looks at what you're doing right now before he gives you something better. Y'all hear? Y'all hear? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It just, I'm sorry. <laughs> But anyway, God doesn't want to curse you and bless you at the expense of you saying that I answered that prayer. He wants the blessings to flow. So you be a blessing and you're in a position to receive a blessing. That's how it works. All right. So he says right here, don't expect to receive if you're not a giver. Proverbs chapter 18. We're love, I love Proverbs. It's the book of wisdom. So in other words, you lack wisdom. Get you, just read Proverbs. You, you'll be wise after that. Proverbs chapter 18. I'm looking at verse 16. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16. We're just taking our time, but we're almost done. I got one last point after this. Anybody want to read Proverbs 18, verse 16 out loud for me? Anybody at all? Giving a gift can open doors. It gives access to important people. Ooh, I like that verse. What is that, NLT? Mm -hmm. All right, read that again, please. Giving a gift can open doors. It gives access to important people. Wonderful. Anybody got another version? Very good, King James. Anybody else? I got an NIV. Mine says it like this. Um, a gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of, of the great. So in other words, a gift or generosity kind of helps reserve a seat for you. You ever been to like a movies or a theater or somewhere and you're like, ooh, those are some good seats right there. And you try to make your way, you make your little happy self there and the usher say, no, you can't sit there because it's reserved for somebody else. Y'all ever been there? And you kind of like, uh, and you kind of <laughs> find somewhere else and you're looking around and everybody, everything else is taken. Well, that's how giving is. It kind of helps reserves a seat for you in a, in a presence where everybody else wants to get in. But only a gift or, or a giver or a generosity kind of uh, position is what he's talking about. He said that kind of thing will kind of open you up into, what does it say? Uh, a gift makes opens a way for the giver. It gives you opportunities. It gives you the RSVP before everybody else is trying to climb in and get there. Because you gave a gift, it's some certain things are just reserved for you. You be praying for it all day long, and everybody's praying for it. And the reason why you get it is because you qualify for it. Because God has seen your giving. There's a story in Acts. Where the Bible talks about Cornelius was praying to God and then the angel came to him and said, you know what? Your gifts went up as a memorial offering. I love how he said it. It's a memorial. God sees you and he sees all the gifts you have and it's a memorial offering. That's why I'm answering this prayer. And the angel came to him and said this. My point is, some of the stuff won't be as hard if you learn how to have a lifestyle of giving. Yeah, it kind of stretches you a little bit, but either you're going to stay where you're at or you're going to go to the next level. Because in order to go to the next level, you got to be a bigger giver anyway. Y'all hear me? Y'all listening, huh? Okay. Uh, Ecclesiastes, and I know it's a lot of scriptures, but I got to feed your faith a little bit. E uh, somebody go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. And somebody else go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. I got about 10 more minutes, and I can knock it out in 10 more minutes. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. For Mm -hmm. And he that regarded the clouds shall not reap. I love that. Read that again, please. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. Mm -hmm. And he that regarded the clouds shall not reap. In other words, if you're looking for something to all look perfect before you decide, I'm going to do this, it'll never happen. Never happen. He who looks at the clouds, oh, it don't look right now. I'm not going to do it. Guess what? Your ship will never come in. It'll never happen. Because you're always looking for the perfect day. Perfect. I know I said that wrong. Ebonics a little bit. But the perfect day will never come because you're always looking around for the perfect time to do something. It's never going to be a perfect time. That's the bottom line. It's never going to be a perfect time because you're living on this thing called earth and you're going to have a little bit of heaven and a little bit of hell. So if you're looking for the perfect time to do it right, there's no time like the present, he's saying, because you're never going to get anything better than this. God said, just start where you're at and let me do the rest. Do what you can do and I'll do what you cannot do. That's what God is trying to do. So you look at the clouds, don't look right. But when the season comes and changes, 
you won't be ready to do it anyway because you're not discerning enough to know that it's the right time. Sometimes the Bible says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. In other words, the time you see it now is the right time. And you can have your voice through a preacher, through, through uh, you know, you by time and prayer, whatever. But whenever God reveals certain things to you, that means that is the set time. But you got to recognize it. All right. Okay. I said Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 11 and 4. Did anybody go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 6? With, that's 1 Corinthians yes. chapter 9 verse 6 or did I write that down wrong maybe it's 2 Corinthians if it's not don't worry I can quote it 1 Corinthians chapter 9 oh yeah it's 2 Corinthians I'm sorry my bad my bad my bad <laughs> okay 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 he says remember this whoever everybody say whoever whoever, whoever means what who, it doesn't matter who it is. It just means that whether you're this or that, whoever you are, it'll work for you. It's a kingdom law. That's what he's saying. Whoever sows sparingly or barely will also reap sparingly or barely. So the reason why sometimes your harvest may be hit and miss every now and then, and it's kind of got this sporadic thing to it, is because you sow sparingly. And whoever sows generously, everybody say generously will also reap generously. In other words, that's a flow to that. If you want to flow, you got to start flowing. If you don't want to flow, then you won't flow because it's sparingly, okay? So God is saying that he wants you to get to the point where he can just bless you flowing in any area of your life. But it's not going to happen if you don't meet God where you're at. So if you don't do anything, then your harvest is that you're not going to get anything, basically, okay? Last point, go there, and then we are going to be done. Go ahead, Quincy. Why isn't it working for me? People got a lot of kind of excuses. This is baby eating lemon for the first time. It's like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but something is not right. Yikes. So it's like you, you, can, you can do the right formula, and you can be calling yourself on this treadmill and saying, I'm giving all I got, but something is not right. There is something that's missing there. How can you do this and, and, and not receive because you obeyed everything else? It goes back again to your heart. It goes back to how you view a thing. Because you can, everybody can go through a formula and do something. But if something happens when you're doing the right thing for the right reason and you get a harvest and then you also just doing the thing and then we wondering, God, what's, how, come I'm not, how come I'm not getting blessed? Well, I'm going to show you just a few things and we're going to be done. Um, everybody, let's go to James chapter 1, verse 7. Everybody got to see this one. James chapter 1, verse 7. Very, very, very familiar scripture. Hebrews, James, and then Peter. Chapter 1, verse 7. You have it? Say, I have it. All right. Um, I'm going to just go to verse, um, I'm going to go to verse 5 and I'm going to read down to verse 7. If any of you lacks wisdom or God's thoughts towards you, he should ask God because God thinks the best for you anyway. Who gives, watch this, generously. In other words, God's always flowing. He's always giving his thoughts to you. All right. And without fault finding. Sometimes you may not qualify so much, but God said, I'll still give you wisdom. Wisdom is free. And it will be given to him. Verse 6. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt in other words it got to hit his heart they go that heart thing because who he who doubts is like the wave of a sea blown and tossed by the wind verse 7 here he goes that man watch this that man should not think he will receive anything from the lord i'm gonna say it again that man should not think he will receive anything from the lord verse 8 he is a double-minded man unstable in all he does in all his ways the reason why certain things are not happening because your mind is double-minded I'm going to do it. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. And then you're with God one time and you're not this time and you've got this kind of double mindedness going on. It will stop God and God will kind of like wait until you get serious enough to be serious. And if you if it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything to God. So if you're double minded, I'm going to do it. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. And you got that kind of schizophrenic thing going on or bipolar. Then sooner or later. God, like, well, your, 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 your harvest will be bipolar. 
It's what you give. It's what you're trying to do. Y'all all right? Y'all listen? It's tight, but it's right. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. All right. What, did I, what verse was that? Okay. So that was James. And I'm going to go I'm reverse that again. He is double-minded, unstable in all he does. So God really, God really doesn't bless a double-minded person. Y'all know that? Because he can't depend on you. You're not faithful at it. You're not flowing at it. As you're double-minded, you got to ask God, help me not to be double-minded in this. Give me whatever you need to give me because I need wisdom to not be double-minded. If you do that, he'll, he'll grant it to you. But once he grants it to you, you got to start operating in that so you can get into a flow. Okay. He, so I, I did that already. Um, so uh, we don't have to go here, but fear of not having enough is another thing. I'm not going to do it because I'm not sure if I have enough. This is one of the things. Can I tell you something personal with me, if I can? I guess I might as well, since I got the pulpit. I might as well. Y'all got no choice but to listen. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I used to be that, this guy, the person that says, I don't, I don't have enough, so I, I can't afford to give, Lord, because if I do, my life's going to get cut off. If I do, they're going to take the car. If I do, this is going to happen. If I do, all this. So you get this fear that kind of comes up whenever it's time to give. And I understand. If anybody understands it, it's me. This is what God did to kind of help me. He starts saying, he said, the reason why you have that fear is because you didn't put me first. Amen. <laughs> what happens is how you view things the first. Remember how I taught you all on the first fruits? How you do things the first will indicate if the fear even even shows up. So with me, this is what he had me do. Because I wanted to give to God and I want to help people and everything. So he started putting on my heart, set aside. Do you like how Uncle Sam takes out his stuff first? He said, you got to do the same thing when it comes to the kingdom. Set aside my portion first. Don't, it ought to be dead to you. And then whatever's left over, you do that. Don't you spend all the way down. And then if you got something left, then you give it to me. He said, that's not good stewardship. Because I used to be that way. And then um, my son asked a question when we were driving here. I don't know what made him ask. It had to be the Holy Spirit. But he said, God, he said, Dad, God, he said, Dad, um, why did God have a problem with people giving? What did you say? Why did you have a problem? We said, why did you have a problem with the lambs? Remember, you said the lambs. Okay, you're gonna get quiet on me now. All right, let me think about it. What did he say? Um, that he was reading in his Bible, and it's and he said that God asked the people, "Give me a lamb without spot, without blemish, without anything." And then he said, "Why did he care so much about the lamb that was without spot?" And then I said, "Because people will just give God anything." They'll give him their leftovers. They'll give him a, a lamb with a missing head and everything and a missing arm. And he said, and, and, and God got to the point that he knows the hearts of people that whenever, you know how it is, like I give him an illustration, whenever you got to share something when he was a kid and you have to share something and your parents say, oh, share your toys or share that candy with him. And you'd be like, I'll share, but what, what did you do? What did you give him? You didn't give him something that you would play with or that you would eat. You would give him the, the candy that, you know, you don't want. You know, here, take this one. And that's how God saw us it's like, I, yeah, Lord, I'm giving, but it's, I, don't, I don't want this one anyway. It's my leftovers. But God is saying, I need you to give me a lamb without spot and blemish. Give me something from the first that, that's something that you want. God does not want what you don't want. God wants what you want. If it means something to you, it'll mean something to God. So that's why he's with me. He told me, you take away. If Uncle Sam going to take out his, you need to take out yours. So what I start to do. And it took me a little while to get that. I didn't just overnight happen. But one of the things I started to do is uh, eventually I would take out. You no, know, if I got a check here, I would just take it out and it would just, you know, God's portion. But then it got to the point when I start auto drafting. Whenever I get a check, I didn't even get to see my whole check because the, 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 the portion of God's portion was already taken out. So whatever my check was, I, that's what I'm working with. I didn't even know that I had this much because that already went to God. Just like, yeah, just like how the government already went to them. You don't even see it. All you see is just the whatever they call it, the net. I just started taking out everything that was from God and I gave it to God first. As I said, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight, but I got into a flow of that. And before I know it, I started seeing more breakthrough, 
more things, more favor, because God looks at your heart. How are you going to treat me first? If you expect me to bless you first, you wake up in the morning, Lord, bless me. It's my beginning of the day. And then God says, well, you really don't want me to bless you because you saved me for the last. If you're going to save me for the last, I'll save you for the last because that's what you sowed. That's your harvest. So you got to look at how it would be if you were, and I say this respectfully, Lord, you got to look at if you were God or if you were a parent, if you were somebody in authority, and this person only comes to you at the end, and then they want something big from you, and they always come in at the very end, or they always doing, giving you the leftovers, how would that make you feel? God is the same way. We, got, we share God's emotions. So you got to kind of, don't just wait to the end when everything else is done. You give all yourself to, I got Sally Mae. Oh, that, that thing will never leave anyway. But Sally Mae, and you got this and everything, and it's like, you got to, okay, I know Sally Mae's coming every month or whatever, but I'm already going to take out this portion for God. And I don't care how it makes me feel. We just going to have to eat canned beans. Or whatever. And it may, take, it may take you having that kind of commitment if you're going to get into this flow. But it's something that God has to kind of reveal to you, and you got to be willing enough to do that. But if you do that, I'm a living witness, God will start turning things around. It'll be tough in the beginning, but he will turn it around. And you won't find yourself waiting to get paid. Oh, is it Friday? Yeah. Oh, Jesus, I need it. No. You'll be like, okay, it's, it's Friday. Oh, I got paid. I didn't even know I got paid. That's what's going to happen. But you won't be looking at the clock all the time if you put God first. I'm almost done. Uh, not, hear, hear, not hearing or helping other people poor. That's, that's one way to can stop it. Hidden sin. If you got certain sin in your life and you're trying to cover it up and you're not trying to ask God to help you with this. And you're up there doing everything you can, but you, you still got certain things that God is dealing with you on. And you are not you are not honest enough to say, God, I got this issue. It can block you from certain things because God doesn't like to bless sin. He knows we all got issues, number one. But the person who kind of covers it up, it gets on God's bad side. I'm not saying you got to confess it to everybody, but you at least got to confess it to God. Lord, help me with this. And you keep it on the altar even if it takes you years and years and years, every day of your life, you keep it there because you're keeping it exposed. You're not covering it up. If you cover it up, no matter what you do, that stuff is not going to come in because sin is blocking it. I hope I'm talking to you all. Yeah. Tradition is another one. Bad tradition. Get in that hundred dollar line. Get that. Get that harvest. Get that. You know that kind of stuff. If you if you get to go to that televangelist and you pay for this, and so I can give you this miracle oil, then you'll be blessed in the next five days. Wait a minute. You start doing all that kind of stuff, and you just Looking at that and not looking at the kingdom or not looking at what the bigger picture, it'll block your harvest. You got to have the right kind of teaching, which we're doing here. Last scripture. Uh, improper talking. Let's go to James chapter 3, verse 8. Last scripture. Okay, yeah, yes, James chapter 3, verse 8. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read it and then we're going to dismiss from here. Uh, I'm going to verse 7 because I like James. James is almost like the New Testament of Proverbs, if you ask me. So, um, 3 and 7. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea can be tamed and have been tamed by men. Verse 8. But no one can tame the tongue. It is, it, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord, Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. In other words, what you say can stop your harvest. What you say can stop what God is calling you to do. If you give something and then you up there contradicting it by what you say and how you think and how you move, the Bible says, what sort of, uh, uh, whatsoever man thinks in his heart is he. So if you think that and it comes out of your mouth and that's all you talk about is that, oh, I'm never gonna come out of this. Oh, Jesus, I'm always gonna be sick and broke. You're going to always have that then. That's exactly what you're going to have. So you could be sowing and you could be praying and doing all this, but you're just contradicted by that tongue. You're going to curse yourself then. So don't be playing, oh, the devil busy. No, you busy. you the one. <laughs> you're the one that's killing your own harvest. So God is saying that you got to make sure if you're going to be, if you're going to get into this lifestyle of giving, make sure your thought life and your mouth are connected to the same thing. If you do that, you're on, you have a very successful chance. I know that you say it in the business world, but you got a very successful chance of being what God calls you to be and doing what God calls you to do. But it has to be a lifestyle. It can't be a one time thing. It's got to be a lifestyle of giving or a lifestyle of generosity. And when you do that, God will start to 
show up a little more in your life. That's how it works. But God's not going to get serious just because you think you're serious. He's going to wait till you get serious first. Then he'll start moving on your behalf. And just take it from me. I know I'm not a, a, a great example, but I, I think I can. I think I got some influence in this area because I've, I've lived this. This is not something that I just kind of, oh, I guess this make a good sermon for FBI. No, I lived this thing because I didn't come from a, 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 a household that we own property and we own houses and own business and own things. I came from Oakland, California, the, the hood. And I was, you know, I was used to seeing poverty and fighting and violence and everybody's talking about, oh, Jesus, the food going up and we ain't gonna be able to eat. I, I was around that kind of stuff. But God allowed me to start tapping into his way of doing things, which is the kingdom. And now I, I came out of it, I brought my family out. My, my boys don't experience that kind of life that, that I had growing up. It's because you have to make this a lifestyle, not just something you do every now and then because you'll get your harvest every now and then. And it's not about the harvest. It's about your full potential of God in your life. Okay? Y'all get anything? Thank you for listening to Upon the Rock broadcast. If this message has been a blessing, you can help us spread the gospel by sharing this message with your friends. Also, if you're online, please be sure to contact me, either through our website at ShakirMinistries.org or through social media. I would love to hear from you. Together, we can build a godly foundation in the lives of people. Until next time, please know that I'm praying for you, and I hope to see you on our next broadcast.